Okay, before Wayne's World, uh, uh, Bob and Doug McKenzie's sketch from Second City TV got a movie. Where I think it's different is, I think the sketches of Bob and Doug McKenzie, The Great Night War from Second yeah. City, is not as successful as the movie. And I think the sketches of Wayne World are far more funny than the movies. Mm, okay. So, uh, before Wayne's World, we had Strange, Strange Brew. Brew. They were talking about it on Kyle and Nick on film. Join us. Welcome back to the show. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Gothi from GoFilmReviews.com. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast, and thanks for watching. And make sure to subscribe or like, tell people. Um, we appreciate the people that have been with us for, uh, before. If you're new, we're just going to critique a film, show a little bit of stills, and talk about it. One of the funniest movies of the 80s I regard, personally, is Strange Brew, from, uh, from well, based on a sketch comedy from what was called Second City TV, primarily a core of Canadian comedians that included Rick Moranis, um, Dave Matthew, uh, Dave Thomas, and John Candy. What's the story all about? All right, yeah. So Strange Brew follows uh, two of Canada or Canada's most yeah. well-known hosers, Bob and Doug <laughs> McKenzie, yeah. uh, who have con concocted a scheme to blackmail free beer from the Elsinore Brewery. Yes, they But did. once there, the brothers discover that something isn't right about this brewery, and before long, they find themselves embroiled in a mystery concerning. Uh, a dead brewery founder, a suspicious brother taking ownership of the company, and a mysterious and dangerous head brewer. Okay, <laughs> this is probably the movie that has the best MGM Lion introduction that I have. <laughs> Did you guys just get stressed watching him play with the tail like that? Because I was like, I know that they're both still alive, so I, I, it's kind of like, okay, I know they're going to be okay. This is okay. the greatest <laughs> intro of the MGM line I've ever seen in my life, and I still get it. I know it's coming, and they still get a laugh. That they, I don't see it, they just don't. Like they fed a beer before. They got yeah. Out. The funniest part about it for me was that the version of the film I was watching was skipping, and so it kept skipping back to that. It, I basically watched that first fifteen seconds like <laughs> maybe five or six times because the copy just would skip back before I was able to get past it. Yeah. Um, what's interesting about this film is you know you said it is kind of based on a sketch from SCTV, but there's actually kind of a hidden story about the creation of these characters that's kind of funny in that yeah. uh, SCTV was moving networks. Um, NBC was going to be taking American mm -hmm. release for it. And in, in Canada, they were going to be over at CBC. But the thing is that there are different laws about advertising in the two areas. Uh -huh. And so there's actually two minutes extra in each episode that airs in Canada that wouldn't air in America. And Canada has on CBC, since they Canadian owned or a Canada like government owned company, they wanted, yeah. they have a certain percentage that has to be focused on Canadian like appreciation almost. <laughs> And so that's even more they had to come up with two minutes that they could throw in every single episode that was about Canada. And that's where the Doug and, the Doug and uh, Bob McKenzie kind of stuff comes from, is that they had to just have two minutes of putzing around. So they filmed those sketches after everyone went home at the end of the film, filming for that day. They get one guy to stay and operate the camera, and these two guys would just putz around and make stuff up. Um, and what's happening there is, of course, John Candy got a film deal. And then they started talking, uh, Rick Morantz and Dave Thomas, like, well, what if we turned this into a movie? And it was kind of a long process of, like, how do we get these two characters who appear in two minutes every week, yeah. um, how do we get them to a feature? Yeah. I know. We incorporate the story of Hamlet into it. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and we make them Rosencrantz and, Rosen and Guildenstein. Well, and I, as, as I'm watching that, I'm starting to figure that out when they mention Elsinore Brewery. Um, which is interesting because, of course, we get Max von Sydow in the film. Who's that best um, villain in the... Yeah. And he appears in the film. It's funny because he actually, uh, I believe it was the seventh seal that he was in where they mentioned going to Elsinore. And then yeah. they changed their mind. They, they, because oh, my God. They decided not to go there. So yeah. I thought that was the reference of it. And it wasn't until I you know, heard the story about the dead father and the uncle that's marrying Claude. Of course, his name is Claude. Yeah, yeah, so often, too, like, it, it's just kind of a creepy thing when, like, uh, you know, the father dies and, like, an uncle swoops in and marries your mom. Like, it's just, it's kind of a thing I don't, I don't feel comfortable with that. So knowing yeah. that, then I was like, oh, Hamlet, Uncle Claude, Claudius. Like, it's kind yeah. of that thing as you're putting it together. Um, and it's such a weird and the way bubbling to think Rosen so. and, yeah, yeah. The bubbling, yeah. And of course, well, it's not really Hamlet, it is um, Pam, played by, uh, her last name is Lynn, I can't remember. Mm, uh, I Lynn. don't know. Um, but yeah, it's almost like a mixture of Hamlet and Ophelia. Yeah, yeah, yeah we kind of uh, fall around. And like you said, a Rosencrantz and Gildenstern being like the, the, the focus of this film is kind of interesting too, because I mean, uh, you know, they are kind of the two characters in Hamlet that don't really have a story. They just show up to comment on the story and then they yeah. disappear again. Well, uh, we talk about uh, one of the uh, 
characters and props of No Man Land was the band. Here is another one that the character and prop of their movie is their band. Yeah, it's true. It's true. We, we live in the band lifestyle a couple times here. <laughs> Not only that, it saves them when they go in the drink, too. Uh, another mention is uh, another character, Paul Dooley, who get, <laughs> kind of gets picked on more than Ned Beatty did in Superman from Lex Luthor. He, he gets more... Kind of get more picked on by Mac von Sydow here. Yeah, when Paul Dooley is a he's a stamp of the eighties. I always remember him as the dad from Sixteen Candles, but of course yeah. he was he, he's still been working up until like recently. He did the Cars movies, he was in Insomnia. He has like one second there. in Slapshot as the radio announcer. <laughs> That's it. So hockey is kind of a thing for him. Yeah, but he kind of permeates throughout without the film there. And um, I like the two villains in the film. I like that there's kind of a bumbling one and then there's like again when you put a Sidow in the film, like you gotta you gotta give yeah, him he's gonna wear black to yeah. do. Yeah. And it's like Max von Sydow, it's almost like he didn't care at all during the 80s because he picked these roles based on relatives. Like, he did this film because his son was a fan of SCTV. He had done Flash Gordon because he had a relative. Yeah, and this really is a year before he did Streamscape, too. Yeah, and so he's kind of just picking, like, he's kind of just picking back and forth. Like, he had done so many prestige films for so long, and now he's just kind of bebopping around. And well, he did Nick Cage before Nick Cage. Right, you just grab a script and just go. There right. Yeah. Now, <laughs> the other thing is, uh, um, not to mention it, is the uh, Rosie, who is played by Scott, uh, how do you say it, McManus? Mc yeah, McInnes? McInnes, think, yeah. Uh, who plays the character Rosie, who's an ex hockey player. <laughs> but he was also in Star Wars. He's yeah. one of the ex wing fighters. Gold leader. Star yeah, <laughs> gold leader. Which, and then, of course, the two guys reference Star Wars in, at, right in his face. Yep. <laughs> oh, and there's a funny thing about that, too, because he's like, oh, yeah, he's seen Je Jedi 17 times. They filmed this movie before Jedi was out. Yeah. So, like, they were just kind of hoping that the movie would still be referred to as Jedi, because at the time there was the Revenge of the Jedi, Change to Return of the Jedi, Jedi, so they yeah. didn't want to include that. Yeah. So they just referenced it as Jedi, and they were hoping the title wouldn't change again, <laughs> um, because this film was going to come out in 84, after Jedi had come out. So it was kind of that like funny moment of like they're self-referencing Star Wars, but they're also kind of risking that Star Wars is still a thing at that point. <laughs> I always say uh, the basis of all com good comedy is undeveloped maturity. You're never going to reach full maturity. And I think every character in this doesn't really achieve full maturity. Other than Henry Green, other than the guy mm -hmm. Henry Green, who's the manager of the beer place, oh. is kind of a little more of a conscientious developed character. But everybody else has a sense of immaturity involved. And, of course, how do you emphasize that? How do you exaggerate it? Well, you bring in Mel Blanc to do the voice of their dad. Yeah. With not really showing their dad, but he provided the voice of the dad. Yeah. And the, it's not, like, obvious Mel Blanc, to me at least. I, yeah. I didn't notice it on the first glance. I actually thought it was one of them. I thought it was Rick Moran. Right. Well, they, they already like, play their parents in that one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. That they was so great. Um, and I think, you know, all the little, like, the film is at its strongest for me when it's absurdist because I, I really like the opening where they're actually like talking about how a movie is made and how they made their movie and then their fake movie <laughs> um, and then them getting thrown out of the theater. Like the absurdist part right. to me. They're going to the film best. a movie and then they're going to make a movie showing you the movie. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> And I like I like those absurdist moments, or like walking in on their parents together, or you know, just like those elements. I think are where the film is at its strongest because it's it's really embracing the the overall stupidity of it. <laughs> yes, um, yes. And you know, these guys are kind of like some of the world's like first stoner comedy stoners, like because I mean they're not yeah, stoner, like they're drunk, kind of, but like yeah. they're kind of like these two guys that are lovable because they're drunks. <laughs> yeah, they're they're harmless. They're not really you know they're just they're kind of bumbling around through life. They're never really going to probably ever move out. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's where, where I'm kind of in the middle of things is like, I don't, I actually think I prefer the sketches themselves because I think that the film tends to overstay its welcome a little bit, focusing on two characters for so long. Some of the stuff I found funny, some of it didn't work for me, but it's kind of interesting because that's a tough thing to do. It's, it's actually, in fact, why I prefer Monty Python's Flying Circus to the oh, films. I'm not actually as big of a fan of like, the, the holy grail as I am of like just the sketch comedy of Monty Python and in fact when people ask me what's my favorite Monty Python movie I say and now for something completely different which was an, a film version yes, of their, their film, yeah. best sketches yeah. I think the sketch stuff is at its best and so for me the film does kind of have this quality of like when it's absurdist I really find it funny and when it's just the two guys bumbling throughout the film and kind of getting stuck I didn't really connect with it as much and of course I've seen this so many times that I can't really criticize it harshly <laughs> anymore because I watched this movie way too many times in the mid-80s. So, mm. yeah. 
and it was part of, it was part of our culture because we always, as kids, always when we played hockey outside, we recited this movie <laughs> why we attacked the goalie. Oh yeah. So, so all the all the, the the wonderful features and the you know the sound effects and everything. So yeah, but this criticism of you know, how Kyle said about this film is I treat like what I say with Wayne's World. I like the sketches more than I do like the movies, mm-hmm. and I think that's it's a problem when you develop something from a sketch that sometimes the movie won't be as valuable because yeah. you're working with a short amount of time and you got to be funny, 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 then you go away. Where a movie, you're going to have to constantly be funny for about 100, what, like 90 minutes at yeah. most. Yeah. Well, that's that's kind of what comes down to it is, you know, I, I on the subject of Wayne's World, I do think I like the movies on par, at least with the sketches. But, yeah. you know, we have, you know, Saturday Night Live, which was the, like, American SCTV, if you will. Yeah. Um, they made a lot of films based on their sketches. and But yeah. for everything, for every Blues Brothers, you have a Stuart oh, Saves His Family. Yeah. For every Wayne's World, you get an It's Pat the movie. Um, like, where it's just like, they're kind of, it, it's whether or not you can maintain or add enough to the source material to really make it worth its worth its while. And that's yeah. why, again, I really like when they get absurdist. When they don't show the dad talking and his head's just shaking and it's Mel <laughs> Blanc talking um, about getting him beers. Or when they, you know, when they are dressed as their own parents or the film within a film thing. Like, those are the parts to me that worked really well because they're embracing the absurdity of what these two characters are. Because... They're not really like all Canadian people are not like that. But it's no. just that, like in America, that's all you had as a reference point. Well, who gives a guy <laughs> bullets put up his nose when they're bleeding? Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, yes, yes, the contradiction of you're supposed to be sophisticated enough to run a brewery, but then you're hiding, right? You're yeah. Hiding the whole plan. And, yeah. But I do like the scenes of Max Von being evil. Yeah, because, I mean, yeah. when you get someone on his caliber, and again, like, I, I really appreciate that the film is, again, like, skewering Hamlet. Because mm-hmm. it's it's an area where I don't even know if most people that like this movie have mm-hmm. read Hamlet mm-hmm. enough to know the references to Hamlet. Like, and, and it's, not, it's, not, it's not picking on you for not knowing that. It's just, it's an added element of, like, higher comedy that they're referencing yeah. within their stupidity. And it's kind of like, again... I, I liken this film to Dumb and Dumber, which came out about a decade later. Yeah, and it's it be- two idiots kind of just like meandering through a mm-hmm. plot line. And in that film too, they have they have no actual like, you know, integration with what's going on in the movie. Or even like the Big Lebowski, where the dude just wants his rug back. He's getting embroiled in all of these other things going on. He just yeah. wants his rug. <laughs> you yeah, know? And pay much. just want their beer. <laughs> they just want their beer, right, because the dad's surprised they actually have jobs now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Even though they look like they're in their 30s. And let's point out, they don't really have jobs. I mean, they don't really do any work when they're at that brewery. Like, I, I no. my inner manager came out of me from my whole previous job. And I was what like, are Man, you doing? I would fire these guys day one. <laughs> 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 they don't look like lawyers. Man. Yeah, exactly. Right, kicking tires and all. So a lot of yeah, of course, and they go drinking on the job. <laughs> they go drinking on the job. Um, you know, it, it's funny because I think there's actually a, a reference to kind of Strange Brew's plotline in the Family Guy episode where he gets the job at the brewery and like kind of yeah. like has to hide the fact that he gets all the free beer he could ever want working there, but yeah, he doesn't want to overstay yeah. his welcome. And so yeah. it's 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 a common idea that's that's kind of been taken from this and the fact that. They're trying to manipulate their way into free beer, and they end up getting a job, job. because of it. Yeah. Um, in fact, that's why a couple of uh, breweries and, and companies wanted to put their names like associated with the film until they realized that these guys were sticking a mouse inside the beer in order to <laughs> manipulate free beer. And so then they took their names off of it. Um, are you going to bring a jar of mouse to a movie theater? I mean, I'm not that guy, but I've been to some theaters where people have done the equivalent of that. Really? Oh, my God. <laughs> where, you know, kind of just like that person who just ruins the whole experience oh, up in yeah. front, you know? Um, that's, kind respect- of, that's kind of creative. Bring a jar. Yeah. I don't know how you can get past security with a jar of flies, but a moss. Or, well, and yeah, how we moss. mentioned uh, uh, Chekhov's plate last time. This is kind of Chekhov's jar of, Chekhov's jar of moths. They mentioned it early in the film, and then yeah. a few minutes later, we actually get to see it embraced. It's, it's yes. you know, that gun's going off all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and I think, if I remember right, they actually made Elsinore beer for a while. I saw a video where two guys were drinking it, so either they yeah. were drinking, like, they were just filling a beer bottle. I think it was like yeah, like publicity yeah. for the film as they had that. There was even a, a ad or a, I guess a novelization of the film yeah. that was in a beer shaped book that you could open up and read. So if I remember, there was, you, you remember you can buy uh, right when this movie came out some kind of 
of I don't know, maybe like a maybe a corporate beer making made an offshoot or what they call that else uh, beer yeah. because of the movie. Maybe it came from Canada. I yeah, but that was one of the first yeah. times that I can remember that happening where product placement goes to beer in a way like that. You know, we get that now. I think every season of Game of Thrones, they released a special beer that you could buy that was like themed around Game of Thrones. But like they I didn't, didn't do that. it that often in the eighties. You know, like they didn't that kind of level of product placement and and integration and marketing just didn't happen. Probably why we got in space. This makes you <laughs> also want to check out um, if you can find them on YouTube the old reruns of Second City TV, which is actually pretty good. Yeah, I revisited some SCTV, especially the the clips with these two guys. It's been a long time since the first time I watched Strange Brew, but I've seen those clips and I've seen those sketches so many times that uh, I wanted to revisit them before jumping into the movie. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, you can find them. They're littered throughout because it's really tough to find full-length episodes. Um, but they are there, and if you if you can hunt them down, it's, it's worth catching. Because you can tell Rick Moranis is actually... I mean, we had talked about him in Spaceballs, and then he was in... And then after this movie, he did Ghostbusters. But he did great impersonations. He does a great Richard Dreyfuss in one of the sketches. Oh, they, yeah. made, they made fun of a Neil Simon bit, like accumulation of a Neil Simon story... And of course, it was Richard Dreyfuss in the movie, and they said Richard Dreyfuss played himself, but it was actually Rick Moranis. Mm. So he could play the character. And I think Dave Thomas was playing Judd Hirsch, and they did such convincing being those two guys. Yeah, they're both you can see actually the talent of they have. They have. Yeah, and, and Rick Moranis, again, like one of those actors that, again, we haven't seen much of in recent years because he had to take kind of a step away from acting. And, and you miss it when you watch movies like this because even when he's at his most incomprehensible, because there's some dialogue in this film I couldn't even catch what they were saying a little bit because they were just so kind of beyond the pale with their accents. Um, but you just, you miss that performance level when you see him. And so like revisiting SCTV was really fun um, and just seeing them kind of playing off each other. In fact, the reason why they both directed this film and wrote it was because the studio head at MGM said, who had worked with Mel Brooks, said like sometimes the only way for the comedy to be done right is for the person who wrote it and knows it to just direct it. He yeah. didn't expect him to do any flashy directing. He didn't expect the best picture winner. But he no, but they comedy, understand the comedy. Yeah, yeah and, and I think comedy, how it works effectively is how you edit it. Mm-hmm. And I think this is where it really works. Is it's edited actually pretty good, really above par editing. Because you're not going to work with the cinematography. You're not going to work with, you know, overall yeah. great acting. You're going to work in how to cut the jokes, you know, and how to be smarmy to each other. Yeah, the comedy that is best is when they when they are able to, again, like the absurdity and also kind of have fun with the timing of things. Yes. Because, yeah, like the film has a very low quality production design level. The scenes in the courtroom, they look like someone put them together for like a, somebody's a living high room? school project or something like yeah. that. You know, and like the music, which I found pretty engaging, is Charles Fox, who did the European Vacation and Short Circuit 2. And like, yeah, the music like is what games. enhances it. I like the, the music is when Henry Bank mentioned Strange Brew, I remember all the music, the, mm-hmm. the, the theme song, the even their little kooky little intro. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there, there's elements that they, they, it's almost like they chose, like, we don't have a big budget, so let's focus on getting fun music, fun editing, and let the production design kind of, yeah. you know, not be at, at its high point. Um, yeah. But it, it, it works enough for me. I think, like, the movie was, was enjoyable, even though I didn't really laugh as much as I was hoping to. <laughs> well, uh, overall, I mean, this is part of my childhood. I watched this more than I watched even Ghostbusters, and this is the movie Rick Moranis did before Ghostbusters, and his career kind of took off where Dave Thomas didn't really take off as much. Yeah, and I, I don't remember him very much other than Rat Race. I don't remember him. Yeah, much. I was just thinking about him and Rat Race, actually, and I think it's odd because it's not that he's not unfunny. It's just he has a specific set of, of comedic skills that work in certain films, and seeing him in Rat Race, I think it's funny because he's not, he's not really speaking throughout most of Rat Race. No. He's kind of just like more of a physical presence that's funny when he is physically present. <laughs> right, but, yeah. yeah, Rick Moranis had a little bit kind of a, a, a wider selection to play with. And it's just, it's weird that Dave Thomas didn't break through in the same way. No, and I, and I don't know, they really should put a John Candy in this movie. Yeah, I'm, well, John Candy, I mean, I think that was the thing, was John Candy, I think it was Going Berserk, was his, like, his breakout film from SCD, SCTV. Yeah. He was kind of already making himself into something, and I just... Don't know if he would if he would have ever been able to get him with the budget they had. He was already making some good money. Yep. Um, the film actually did almost have a sequel in uh, no, 1999 really? called Homebrew, which was going to feature Dan Aykroyd as a friend of theirs when they all get inv- invited in and start working on the microbrewing oh. out of their home. Um, it actually went uh, it went as far as to get almost funding before funding fell through. 
Uh, and Todd McFarlane, you know, creator of Spawn, actually yeah. said he was going to try and help get enough, secure enough funding to get the movie up and going. Well, that's I, don't, kind of, I don't really know the connection between the two, but... Because he, he's really Canadian, that's what... Yeah, that's true. Because <laughs> he's Canadian, and any, anytime you talk about Canadians, it's, it's it's an homage to this movie. Yeah, it's yeah. funny how, how they're, they're kind of skewering Canadian lifestyle in, in so many ways, and it's it's embraced so much. And it's kind of like we in the, the, the Midwest area embracing the movie Fargo and the TV show that came with it, too, as being kind of like, it's not really kind to us. Not really. We kind of embrace it for its faults, and I yeah. think that's kind of what makes the two uh, interesting. But I enjoyed the two guys' chemistry. Yeah. Um, Paul Dooley, again, always underrated. Nice to see well, him in the film. It's, I know, because we talk about the comedy of the film, but he actually, he, he is a funny part of the movie. I think right? Dooley has the best lines in the movie, or the best, like, overall sequences, you know, like, where he's like, please explain a time code. Well, just because I don't know doesn't mean I'm lying. <laughs> or, or, um, the my... inspector tells him, well, who, who chiseled this? Um, some sculptor. <laughs> oh, yeah. I thought you had a photographic memory. It uh, comes and goes. Um, I, my favorite line of the whole movie, though, comes down to uh, when they're talking about uh, the woman's father having passed away and how you still have your memories of him. And I think the wife, act, the, the mother says, um, well, the colonel's dead. But we're still enjoying his chicken. Which and I thought some... that was a great line. It's such, I'm going to use it every time I eat KFC. <laughs> and they're living in a castle. They're loaded. But yeah. they're going to have KFC. <laughs> You know, the, the dining room is like the most expensive. This this more far more expensive than anything I have in my house. And having cakes. I mean, to quote other Canadians, if I had a million dollars, I'd buy you craft dinner. So, <laughs> like, it's not it's not the craziest thing. I know, I know, but it's just, yeah. Um, but yeah, again, Max von Sydow, wonderful to see. I, I love when he embraced the silliness, or he embraced kind of something that was just outside his wheelhouse. Because he had just, you know, he'd been the Exorcist less than a decade before. He was yeah. embracing his. And his he wore black and blue. Um, oh, fun question. I'm going to see if you catch this. Uh, Max von Sydow and Rick Moranis appeared in another film together. They uh, both acted in another film together, but they didn't share any scenes. Can you name the mm, film? I, I don't think so. Uh, Pan, no, what, what is it? It's, it's kind of a trick question in a way because it's Ghostbusters 2. Max von Sydow oh. voices Vigo, the living penguin. Get out! Um, and I, I, it's, a, it's one of my favorite little fun facts about him is that he voices the painting in Ghostbusters 2. So they get another film together even if they don't share any scenes. <laughs> right. But, I never knew that. Right. Yeah, as it comes down to it though, uh, Strange Brew for me is it's kind of a mixed brew in a way where it's like some things I really like, some things I didn't, but overall I'm happy to have had the experience of watching and I would like to revisit it. it at the very least, it made me want to go back and revisit FCTV. Yeah. Um, and I know this being a, a favorite of your childhood, you definitely got to recommend it. <laughs> yeah, it gets a soft spot because we, you know, as a kid, it's part of my, you know, growing up, just like a lot of other movies, you know, from the 80s. So, yeah. yeah. And then you watch it now as an adult and like, it's something that I never do again. The, the comp, again, like the absurdity and me being able, the eye rolling moments, kind of like Mel Brooks's work, like when you roll your eyes more <laughs> in the film because of just how grown worthy some of the jokes are. That Who was puts when I thought jelly in their winter jackets. Mm -hmm. Gotta jelly donuts. Gotta keep stuff around. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. That's, you know, jelly donuts. Right. See. But what do you guys think about Strange Brew? Let us know down in the comment section below. Um, were there any other sketches that you were fond of from SCTV that would have made great films? Because they didn't really branch out too much from SCTV. We are accepting bribes of jelly donuts too. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, our PO box. No. Um, <laughs> but let us know down in the comment section below your thoughts on this this classic comedy from the '80s. On this classic love of, of Canadian culture. Um, you can also, like we said before, you can like, you can subscribe, and you can join the Patreon so you can help us pick some of the different films we're talking about this yeah. season on Kyle and Nick on Film. Uh, once again, guys, my name is Kyle Gothi, and you can find all my film reviews on GoFilmReviews.com. I'm Nick from the St. Paul Film Cast, and take off. Yeah, you closers. <laughs> <laughs>